Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am excited to be here with Friedemann from Holistic Songwriting. So as you know, we are the Profitable Musician. We're all about making money as musicians, and writing good songs is an important part of that. So we're going to be talking about some techniques on how you can write better songs, how you can get that creativity flowing, how you can just really make what you've written better. But before we get into that, Friedemann, I would love for you to let them know a little bit about you, your background, how you got into songwriting and how you got to where you are now. Cool. All right. That's a lot of questions. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Friedemann. That's a German name. It's weird here as well. Don't worry. So I'm a songwriter slash producer. My main thing is is teaching songwriting, which I do with a passion. Like this is this is the thing I really want to do. And I've been so I've, I have a bachelor of music. I started out writing music when I was when I was 12 years old, had my first band at 15. And that kind of grew uh, a little bit and became a really important thing for me personally. I, had a, I was bullied a lot in school because I had long hair and looked like a girl and people, you know, made mean comments about that. So the band was the thing that gave me all my confidence. And it was literally a thing that kind of kept me from, you know, falling into all these terrible depressions and things like that. It was really the thing that kind of kept me going. It was really a very important for me thing for me personally. And I then studied music, which was great. I studied in the Netherlands, studied um, music production and and writing music for media so for radio and films and, and video games but also the radio which has been uh which was really awesome and then i started uh with holistic songwriting which is uh which is this songwriting company that that i'm, that I'm working with working on right now i wrote a book called the addiction formula which later turned into a bestseller started a youtube channel called holistic songwriting which has over 400,000 subscribers now i think last time i checked and we did a kickstarter uh and the latest thing that we're doing is holistic songwriting academy which is this whole it's this massive online learning experience it's like a it's like a university essentially with like weekly zoom calls for people to uh to really hone their craft every week and tons of courses there's like 32 courses in there on different subjects but yeah i mean i really see myself as kind of a a puzzler like i'm really interested in the puzzle of music like that's my favorite thing to work on i'm really passionate about um figuring out how certain things work i love figuring out the formulas of music figuring out blueprints and things like that and so a lot of our content is kind of based on that as well like i'm trying to figure out ways in which we can find blueprints for lyric writing for example or blueprints for how to write songs Songs more efficiently so we can write them quicker and better uh, without killing ourselves over it because you know the creative game can be a bitch sometimes so that yeah i'm a musical detective slash puzzler that sort of that's sort of my thing that's what i'm really interested in i guess i like that how you distinguish yourself as a puzzler or detective which I mean, I love the idea of blueprints. And I think the first time that I heard about you was your YouTube channel. Um, and so you really amassed a lot of interest on your YouTube channel. What do you think makes you different as far as the way you teach songwriting? Obviously, part of that is, is the puzzler and the blueprint kind of thing um, versus other people that people can follow to learn songwriting. I guess it would really the the holistic approach. Like, I don't just look at the songwriting, which traditionally speaking is chords, melody, and lyrics, but I'm really interested in everything. I think songwriting is so much more than just those three things today. I mean, it's all of music production, but there's a whole other inner game based behind that, you know, uh, your inner game can get so in the way of of you being able to write at your best, uh, you know, and that's when we get writer's block and all those 
those kinds of things. I'm really interested in things like Groove, for example. Nobody ever talks about Groove, but I I mean, we we made a whole 30-hour course just on how to lay out notes within an arrangement, how, to, how they interact with one another and how loud they need to be in order to make someone move along to your song. And I think it's such a massive thing. It's so undervalued, but it's the whole physical aspect of your song is are people moving along to your song? So, and then for example, I what I'm really interested in is, like I'm very interested in psychology as well. So for example, for chords, I don't just look at, oh, here's the theory of that and this note has to go here and resolve here or whatever. I mean, we do that too, but I'm not so interested in the music theory of it all. I'm more interested in the effect that it has on people. Just like I'm interested with groove, I'm interested in how does it people move. With chords, I'm interested in how does it move people emotionally. So it's more that emotional aspect of things and which chords can we choose if we want to create a certain specific emotion within a listener. So that's what I'm most interested in is more the effect that these tools have on people so that when we write music, we can pick the right tools for the job that we want. So if we have a song that we want to be bittersweet, like what are the perfect grooves, the perfect chords, the perfect kinds of melodies, the perfect lyrics, the perfect writing style of lyrics even to get that emotion across so people really feel that and they don't just hear the lyrics and they're like, oh, I guess this is a song that's bittersweet, but they actually that actually connects in all parts of their body. I love the idea of having tools to help artists create those effects that you're talking about. Um, do you ever find that giving them the tools and the blueprints sometimes actually just makes their music start to sound a lot the same or that makes one person's music start to sound like another person's music because they're using these tools and blueprints? Or do you have a way of teaching them to utilize these tools in a way that, you know, it's helping them and not kind of stunting them? I think what's really important with that sort of thing is to really explain the blueprint well and, and explain why it is here. Uh, I think formulas very often ha just have to do with expectations. For example, the reason we have verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus is because that's why 90% of all the songs are this structure is because that's the expectations that listeners have going into a song. And, and it's based on off of three act structure. And you can totally break that. And that's a big part of what we teach is how to manipulate those systems. But I think you first have to understand what the the formula that people expect is because you can only break expectations if you know what the original is. And that's one of the most fun things I think about. I think about songwriting is to always break rules. That That is the most fun part is to figure out, okay, this is what they expect. So I'm going to hit them with this instead. And I'm going to surprise them here. But I think surprise can really only happen if you first show them Okay, I'm. I, if you if you give them something that they can't predict, if your song starts off surprising, that is really overwhelming for the brain. Essentially, it's really hard to listen to music like that when it's just constantly surprising. After a while, we just shut down and we're like, okay, I don't get this apparently. But if it starts out in a way that you expect, a song that kind of starts off with a with a with a smaller intro builds up to a chorus, and we expect it to be a huge chorus like most songs, and then it goes very small. Like, um, look what you made me do by Taylor Swift or mm -hmm. Chop Suey by System of a Down, if you want a different genre, right? And it completely shuts down for the chorus. All of a sudden, you're like, it, it gives you that feeling like it's, you know, where you hold your breath because you're like, wow, that totally came out of nowhere. But that wouldn't work if we had started the song off with with all these chaotic ideas and trying to do too many things at the same time. Well, and what's interesting is with the Taylor Swift song, for me at least, it actually made me look at the verse more and go, wow, I really like this verse. I actually kind of hate the chorus, but like <laughs> I, I put up with it because it fits well in the song, but it actually highlighted the verse to me. I was like, now you got to pay attention to this because maybe this chorus isn't your favorite part or it's not doing what you expected. And so it can actually, you know, make your experience with the song a little bit different. Yeah, totally. I mean- Totally. That's 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 what it does is it just reframes the way you usually think about a song and it makes it feel very different just because you flipped one little switch and went the other way. It makes you completely rethink the entire thing. And all of a sudden you go, "Ooh, no, this is something special. I should really listen to this. It really and I, I call this the gefährlich approach. Gefährlich is the German word for for dangerous. I had a, mm -hmm. an ear training teacher who always said to us, you got to sound gefährlich. Those were his exact words. And I love that. I think it's so true. And I think what what this does does is if you lull us into a certain safety and then you do something unexpected, what it does to the brain is the brain goes, oh, I know this. I know this. I know this. And suddenly something new happens and the brain goes, something new. I don't know this. I need to learn how this works. Pay 100% attention to this. 
and this and that's what the brain actually gives you uh, endorphins for if if because it wants you to to pay attention because here's something the brain doesn't understand yet and so putting in these little tiny surprises within your songs actually release endorphins for the listener and make them pay more attention to what you're doing. Yeah, I love that. I love that connection with what what's going on in their mind and their brain and all that. It brings to mind with the Taylor Swift example, you talk about image in relation to songwriting. Most people are talking about, you know, developing an artist image in relation to marketing and branding and things like that. And so how do you talk about using your songwriting to develop your image as an artist? I think it's a it's a two-way street. I think they both are very, just very much connected. But I think it's a good idea for any artist out there to first take a look at who am I and how do I want to put myself out there? And those are two different things. You don't want to put yourself out there because personalities are so complex. It's going to be really hard to sell that, unfortunately. You know? And by selling, I don't just mean money-wise, but also in terms of emotionally selling that. It's very hard to sell a complex person. We like characters who have, you know, what we call depth in writing would be a character that has two or three warring traits, but not 50. And usually people, like real people, are like more like 50. So it's very hard to get that across to an audience, I think. So I think it's really important first to create an image for yourself. I call it the court the cardboard cutout. It's the 2D version of yourself. Um, and, and you go like, okay, this is the image that I have when I'm when I'm performing for for artists or for an audience out there. And so what you do is you basically just cut it down. Instead of finding yourself, you define yourself, right? It's you figure out which traits do I not need and which are really interesting about me, which traits make me really fascinating to the world. And then you use those traits. And I usually tell people to come up with three to five positive traits and one to two negative traits. Negative traits less, not because they're not good, but they're actually so powerful. They're like traits on cocaine. They're like crazy, crazy powerful. I just, that's why I think they can really take over an entire image if you have too many of them. So I usually tell people just try to find one. And then you try to express or you express those traits and the flaw within everything that you do, starting with the music, of course, but with everything else as well. We have this thing called sample, S-A-M-P-L-E. So S is for socials. Anything you do socially could be an interview. It could be anything where you interact with other people. A is for artwork. So all of your visual stuff that you do, whether it's illustrations for your albums or promo shots. M is for music. So this is, again, and this permeates everything that we do at Holistic Songwriting Academy, chords, groove, melody, lyrics, structuring your songs. P is for products. So this is your merch, essentially, finding merch articles that represent who you are instead of just having a shirt and a cap, like everyone. One of my favorite examples of this is, and I just try to float that into any conversation, is there's a, I forgot what the artist is called, unfortunately, but there's a, an extreme left artist that sells that 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 hands out this is not a merch article technically because they're free but they're handing out free matchbooks with instructions for how to build a molotov cocktail wow. and i think that's such a that's such a gefährlich dangerous merch article that only that artist could have done you know only if you're really far left that that makes total sense uh, so that's anyway that's p l is your live show your live performances what you say in between songs how you appear on stage what kind of you know what you wear things like that and then e finally is uh, electronic stuff this is your music videos your website and things like that i like that i really like that uh, sample acronym that's really helpful to remember everything so let's talk about the writing process how can we, sometimes I know for me, I've gotten into writing a song and like I've started in the morning and all of a sudden it's dark outside. Like, you know, you just get really into that mode or you get kind of stuck and then you keep pushing through going, I just really need to finish this. What kind of tips do you have for helping songwriters write quicker? Yeah. Songwriting uh, process is, uh, I love talking about this because it's such a big pain point for so many writers and really what so many writers are struggling with the exact same things. And what my job as a songwriting teacher allows me is to just really look at all those questions and find good answers for them. And normally when you're a songwriter, you don't really get to do that because you have stuff to do. You have deadlines. You don't really get the time to just sit down and experiment and see what works best for you. So I come up with a lot of good solutions for a lot of big problems. Uh, one of the, and I'm, so there's a lot of stuff to this. Like we have a, a course on this, just on this subject, but let me just give you a few pointers that I think are really useful. One that I think is really cool is 
you having deadlines for yourself throughout your project so you know when your song is finished. That's really important. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of questions from people who say, how do I know when my song is finished? How do I know it's good enough? And that's one of the biggest problems that you that you will have, not just because the over the perfectionism and all that stuff, but also because it's keeping you from finishing your song. If you can always push back the end, then you'll never finish it. And at some point you'll just get bored. You need to be able to see the 100% line. You need to be able to move closer to that every day in order to feel like you're actually progressing with your songs. If you're not doing that, you're never going to finish songs or only if you're lucky and you have something that just clicks for some reason. So that's a, that's definitely a big one is making yourself a deadline saying, by then I need to be done and figuring out early like, what done means for yourself. Another thing would be probably the most crucial deadline for myself, the one that I never, ever break now, is the deadline is at the end of the first session, I need to have the full song. I need to have a song that I can listen to from start to finish. Meaning the next time I come back to this session, I need to press, be able to press play and listen to the whole thing from start to finish doesn't have to sound good. In fact, it's actually better. I mean, it's called a rough draft. It should actually be rough, I think. If it's too good, I don't think you worked on what's important because for the first version, you really should just work on getting across the song, figuring out like, where do the big moments happen? How do I build up to them? Uh, what is the big story that I'm telling? And kind of roughly rough it in. That's really what the first section is about. So that is my hardest deadline I have is at the end of the first session, I need to have a song I can listen to when I come back to it. And then then I think it's important to take some distance from your track. Um, and in that time, I don't think you should listen to your song at all. And I get a lot of backlash on this from, from writers because everybody loves their self-congratulatory walks, you know, where we take our phone with us and we listen to our own music. We're like, oh gosh, I'm so good at this. This is great. This is the best thing you've ever written. Gosh, you're brilliant. So good. You know, we love doing that sort of thing. The problem with that is, is that we get used to our demos and that leads to what I call demoitis is that we fall in love with our demos and it becomes very, very hard to kill our darlings, to, mm. to, to edit ourselves, to rewrite things. And what we try to do instead is instead of just fixing the, the mistakes, we, which means either figuring out what's wrong and then fixing that or sometimes completely completely rewriting sections, we try to fix them by really not changing anything at all. And that's very hard to do and it just doesn't work. So I'm a big proponent of really not listening to your music at all outside of your working sessions. So, and it has one really amazing side effect as well is when I come back to my sessions now, like I, I my memory is terrible, right? Like I always say I have a memory like a fly on a booze cruise. When I come back to a session, I can't remember anything from my song most of the time. Like maybe like, oh, I think there was some, I, I remember what it was about, but I barely remember the basics of it, right? So what I can do is I literally sit on my hands, press the play button with my nose and just listen to the whole thing from start to finish. Not being able to interject, not going into changing small things. That stuff doesn't matter right now. It's just a matter of listening to your song, hearing what you have right now and figuring out, okay, what's good about this? What could be better? Which sections are problematic? And then fixing those big things first. Uh, is it fun? Right, another really big question. Does it, do I actually like it? Is this, does it give me something? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch more, but I think those would be three really big pieces of advice that I think are probably useful, hopefully for everyone out there. Oh yeah, no, those are really, really good. I especially love the... Uh don't listen to your demos because I've been there. I've definitely gotten yep. so used to a version of a song and then people have given me constructive criticism and I'm I'm trying to fight back. I'm trying to say, but no, but this version's better. And you know, these are smart people. Like I need to listen to them and not hang on to this version of it that I think is better just because I've heard it so many times. Totally. Love that. You know, it really helps to make the first, to strive actually to make the first version sound bad. <laughs> because that will make you want to remake it. Like mm. it's impossible to like, because like, I know this is going to be great. That's the, that's the attitude you want to have towards your song. You shouldn't say like, oh, this is already amazing because then you fall in love with your demo and then it's going to be really hard to change, to make the changes that you need to make. But if it, from the start, you just say like, okay, let's make something that doesn't sound very good yet, but I know it will at the end of my process. That's really hard for a perfectionist to do. I know, you know, for me, when I had to start doing free writing and stuff, that was hard because I didn't want to just write gibberish or anything that wasn't, you know, crafted, right? It's, it's hard for a perfectionist to say, I'm going to be okay with writing crap at first. It is. For sure. Maybe one more technique that I that I like using is called the I call it the Rubin rule is um, 
because this is this is hard for a lot of people. And the rule that I've come up with is to just give it a little bit more structure, because I think the thing about free writing that is so unappealing to a perfectionist is like, I don't want to waste all this time. I, I just want to work on making something perfect, right? But if we feel like everything we do is is working towards something, I think it makes that easier to overcome that, I think. And so the Rubin rule says, like, if you are stuck on something, if you're noticing you're getting too perfectionist with things, write five things very quickly in the same amount of time it would take you to write one thing well, and then pick the best one. And I think it gives it a really nice structure where you're able to, first of all, explain to yourself why you're doing this. And there's always a goal. I had a I had a song, for example, for my for my record that hasn't been released yet, but for it's the second Kenad record. Uh, so Kenad is my is my artist project, and I had this song. I finished it as I said in the first session. Came back to it, realized, oh, I love the chorus. It's one of my favorite choruses I've ever written. The verses not so good. They're okay, but not so not as good as the chorus. And I struggled with that song for months. I couldn't figure out how to write a better verse. I was really trying to rewrite it, trying to you know find different ways to make it work. None of it worked. And so I, eventually, I realized, why don't I just use one of my own techniques? Let's just use the Rubin rule on this. And I literally spent thirty minutes. I, I copied the chorus six times, so I, and and left gaps in between. And so then I wrote five different verses in between those gaps and then just listened to it front to back. And immediately I knew which one was the best mm. one. And then that's how I found my verse. A problem I'd been working on, a song I'd literally been working on for two or three months, solved in an hour of work, really. Like half an hour of, of putting it together, then five minutes of figuring out which one was the best one. And then half an hour to to make it to get it to the point where I was really happy with it. Wow, that's really cool. And I mean, this just illustrates what you do so well is that you know you take what I said. How do you get out of your perfectionism? And you created a framework around it to help me get out of my perfectionism, a, a thing I can follow See? to do I'm, right. I'm really and then sorry. I've done it. Okay, let's talk about groove. I think groove is something that's not talked about enough. In fact, we just started a songwriting challenge in our community. Um, and this is one of the challenges we gave them is to create a groove or a uh, counter melody that's going on in the instrumentation while their melody is going on. How do you even start coming up with something like that? Uh, oh, God. I mean, groove is a really quite complex subject where it really goes to the nitty gritty and we really have to look at like notes and where to place notes and things like that. So at for Holistic Songwriting Academy, I've identified seven different what I call movement patterns. And really the thing that I focus on now is really to question how does this song move? Like what is the way I want my audience to move to this song? And then every decision I make in the arrangement, every decision I make with note placement, note loudness, interaction between notes, and note length. Note length is another really undervalued uh, factor of, of groove, actually. All of that has to feed into that movement pattern, just making sure that the song moves in the way that I intend it. And so there's just to give you like two of them, like one of them is, for example, like that, which has this really like this kind of movement pattern to it. I call it the isochronous movement, right? Because it takes the same time to move the head down as it moves to move them up. And we have a, what I call the gyrate movement, which is more like the, which has a very slow downward movement. So, ooh, and a sharp uptick, for example. And there's a, again, those are just two of set out of seven. But really everything I do for Groove is, and how we teach it is really every decision in your arrangement should be made or of, of where you place your notes is made based off of, are you getting across that movement pattern? And, and are you consistent with your movement pattern throughout your entire song? And are you generally creating the groove before you create the song's melody or the other way around? It often comes first. I mean, one of my favorite things to do with songwriting, like I, I don't ever teach people how to how to write songs, like with what they should start with. I think one of the best things about songwriting is that we can start with anything. And I've, I mean, I've started writing melodies based with the with the backing vocals. You start with the backing vocals and then you write the melody, right? So it's completely backwards, but it works and it's great. And you come up with some really interesting ideas. Um, so I've done both. I've also, when I'm coming to a project late, that's already like 60, 70% done, I will often check the movement pattern and make sure it is consistent and it does work. And I've often also come in and thought like, you know, this movement pattern doesn't really support this melody very well, because that's that's another really big thing that you kind of asked about is that that counterpoint between melody and the music. That's really what this is about. It's the movement pattern versus how the melody interacts with that movement pattern. And sometimes I come into a project and I'm like, you know, that melody doesn't, doesn't really sing. It doesn't really soar. And that's because the movement pattern underneath it is just is too similar or it's too different. 
it doesn't really support that melody very well. It doesn't really give it the emotion that I would want that melody to have. And so I just go through the project really quickly, change a couple of notes, move a couple of notes around and change the movement pattern. And all of a sudden the whole song moves very differently. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's quite a drastic change, but the melody feels completely different. And 80, 90% of the time, people are really, really stoked about that change. It's really... You know, it, it has that effect of like, hey, this is still my song, but all of a sudden it's it's better. You know, you get that feeling of like, whoa, like this is like a, a new version of my song, but a really, yeah, the melody sounds so awesome now. You know, it has that, it because it's still, it doesn't really change anything about your song, but it feels completely new uh, and fresh in a way. And so that's been, that's been one of my secret, secret tricks I, I use when I'm, when I come to a project late as a sort of advisory producer mm. or songwriter. Mm. I like that. And it probably is a little easier to see that when you're coming to the song as an outsider, I think for me, I think it would be hard to, I'd need to develop skills in order to see how a groove can support it just because I've never written that way before. So I think it's really cool that you're developing those skills because it's just a, it's a whole nother, you know, framework for making the song better. Totally. Yeah. It's horizontal arrangement, right? So often we, in like when I, because I studied music, as I said, so often we just talk about chords and melodies and that's all vertical arrangement, right? Like what are the intervals between notes and things like that? How do, how do they relate to the key? What we really never talk about is horizontal arrangement. How are notes laid out? How long should notes be? Something we never really talked about in, in, in university, which is crazy. Such an important such a big deal. It's such a big difference whether you play do 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 or do 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 or do 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 like more of a swing feel. It makes such a huge difference to to the listener, and it really feels very different depending on the movement pattern you want to get across. Yeah, it definitely does. Well, let's switch your gears again and talk about lyrics, because I know you've got some really good tips around writing lyrics as well. And I'm curious, do you have any recommendations on like writing the lyrics first and the music second or the music first, lyrics second? Or is it just kind of how your muse works? I mean, both can work. I struggle recommending like a, a very one-sided approach where you really like completely write the melodies first and then puzzle in the lyrics. I don't think that works. Mm -hmm. I think there needs to be some give between both of them. It, it needs to be a process where you go back and forth a couple of times. Otherwise, your result is not going to be what you want it to be. The same thing for writing lyrics first and then coming up with melodies for that. I don't think that's a good thing. And, and again, not being able to go back and forth a couple of times. I think that back and forth, what you're doing is essentially your melody is, that's that's your melody. The the lyrics on one hand side, they're, they provide, they shape the sound of that melody, right? That's a really important part. Like if you were a producer, maybe an easier way to think about this is those are your your knobs, your filters, right? That's how you you shape the sound of the melody. It's a really massive thing, which vowel you use has a massive impact on how your melody is going to come across. But of course, it's also the content of the lyrics, what you're actually saying. Um, so my process, the one I recommend on HSA, is actually goes back and forth a lot more. And it's really about finding a good balance between the two halves. And I think it's kind of a a myth that you really need to be in one of those two camps. I certainly was more, I would say more melody focused early on in my career until a couple of years ago, where I was really like, I think melody, if I ever have a struggle between melody and lyrics and I have to make a decision based on one or the other, like if I have to favor one or the other, I have a great line, but it doesn't sound good. Or I have a great melody, but it, uh, it doesn't really say anything. I usually went for melody. Now I make the decision more based case by case, really. But I, I've definitely discovered a lot more what, what great content can bring to text. So my approach really is, what I think is really, really important, what a lot of people don't do, is before you start writing your lyrics, you should kind of know what they're about and you should start free writing first and just kind of get your ideas on paper. I have a thing called the lyric diary, which is basically as if you were writing into a diary, you're writing, you're having a conversation with this imaginary someone. I call it, uh, I call her Lydia because Lydia lyric diary, right? So, and then I just, I just write free form, almost free form. Like there's a couple of tricks I use to make it already sound a little bit more like lyrics. And then 90% of the time I have like f at least four or five good lines out of that where I'm like, okay, this is my, those are my chorus lines, or this is my opening line for my, for my verse or something like that. And then it becomes, and then, then I, I have a whole process 
that I again go through before I write any definitive lyrics, before I write really, before I really write the melody, where I structure that out and kind of figure out how am I going to get this idea or this story or whatever it might be. How do I get that across? It's called the Lyric Canvas 2.0. Is that's one of our many, you know, blueprints where I structure it out into verse one, verse two, bridge and the choruses. And there's certain, yeah, I think I would say rules for how to do that well, because the music obviously comes with certain, the music tells a story as well. And I think the, one of the few rules that really exist in music is that the, the lyrical storytelling should match the musical storytelling. And if it doesn't, there should be a good reason for it at least. Right. So that I think is really important to really understand how, how musical storytelling works to be able to, to kind of figure out the structure of your lyrics. And then it's a lot of the, the process is a lot of back and forth and writing a line here, switching back to the chorus, writing a line there and kind of piecing it together bit by bit. And there's a lot of rewriting as well. It's never just you write it down and that's the line, but it's also not, and I want to make this very clear again. It's not, I start at the top from the first line and then I write the lyric down. This is what mm. most writers do. And I think it's a mistake. I think to really have a good overview over your story and to really figure out how you're going to shape things. Okay, I need a line here that leads into this later on. Okay, and maybe I should have a good line that leads out of this as well, right? You write a line here, then you go, okay, I think I should set this up earlier. Let's write a line in verse one. And you're still not really writing lines. Some of those lines might translate later to, to actual lyrics, but you're really just trying to figure out like what needs to go where, how do I want to say things? And then out of all of that material that you've collected, and for me, this goes very quick. This is like half an hour's work because I've done it so many times. It's become intuition. I don't have to look at my uh, Lyric Canvas 2.0 anymore. This is all in here, right? And then out of all of that work that you've done, you essentially write your your melody actually like your lyrics like the the lyrics influence the melody so much it is really a it is a process where both of those are being written at the same time and i think that's the best way to do it so when you're writing lyrics and melody at the same time so that's that's how you get the best fusion between those both worlds and you have the sound you have the meaning and you also have the beautiful melody mm. yeah i really like that and that's why it's holistic songwriting right cuz you're not just okay, let's write these lyrics. Let's write this melody. Let's see how I can fit them together. It's all happening at the same time, but yet there's still kind of an order to it in order to, to follow the blueprint. So I really like that yeah. approach. And since you wrote the book, The Addiction Formula, I'd love to know, you know, what are some ways that songwriters can make their songs more addicting? Because we want people to stream them over and over again. So The Addiction Formula is about structure in a way. It really is about how do you set up your song? How do you tell, how do you let your song tell a musical story? That's essentially the question I'm interested in with that with that book. And we're also making a course right now, the Addiction Formula 2.0, which is some, with some updates and more examples. But the, the basic idea of it is how do you keep every part of your song interesting? Um, obviously we have, so so in the, the, the core thing that we're looking at here is energy. High energy sections, typically your choruses, are very satisfying, right? But if you only have satisfying sections in your song, your song becomes very boring, very predictable. So we need low energy sections. Low energy sections are not very satisfying. So we have to figure out ways in order to make those interesting to drive our interest towards the next moment of, uh, of gratification. So we have periods of, of anticipation. Those are your verses, your pre-choruses especially actually, and your bridge often as well. Those are the moments, those are the sections or rather that should build and, and really set up everything that's going to happen and, and put this thought into our mind of like, yeah, I know this is low energy, but something cool is, is on the horizon. This cool thing is just around the corner so that when the chorus actually comes, it's massively satisfying. This actually is, it's really interesting, I think, because I, the number one question I get asked for people who haven't seen any of my stuff is, so how do you write a great melody? And I think a lot of the time, what it comes down to is I hear so many good melodies out there from, from amateur, amateur writers or not so good writers, maybe, where I think like, wow, that's actually a really good melody. The problem isn't actually that this melody isn't good. The problem is that it hasn't been set up right. It doesn't land right. You know, it doesn't come at a point in the song where, I, where I'm like, I can't wait to see what's going to happen. And then this thing drops and I'm like, oh, my God, that's what I like. That's what I've been looking for. I can't believe that you just just put this in front of my very eyes, you know, or my very ears or whatever. That's what it needs to feel like. You build up to your best moments and then 
boom, there it is. But what I see so often, or rather hear so often in people's songs is that it feels more like their their songs are saying, okay, so here's an idea that I've been working on. Um, and here's another idea. And here's also another idea. And here's a, another idea on top of that. And what do you think of this idea? I'm not so sure. Is this a good idea? Maybe I should show you this idea as well. And have this very variation of it, which I'm sure you're going to love. Oh, and, and this, and this, and this, you know? And it becomes just very confusing, very tiring. And again, what I said earlier, if you don't follow certain formulas within your songs, and this is where the addiction formula is especially important, I think. For me, it's probably one of the strongest formulas in music, actually. If you don't follow that formula, or you don't understand how to build up energy towards certain moments and then to really deliver those really gratifying moments, um, it becomes really confusing for the listener and becomes a, a moment where they where they either go, uh, okay, this is just overwhelming. I don't understand this. And they turn it off or they get really bored or they think nothing's going to, going to, going to happen. And they don't even hear your best chorus or the, your best section. And all those things are really frustrating. So that's why I've created the addiction formula. It's a set of tools that shows you exactly how to build those energy curves and how to actually do that specifically with specific techniques. You know, where should you put drum fills? How, where should your vocals go up? And why should your vocals go up? Or when should they go down? Is going up into falsetto the same thing as going up into belting? Questions like that uh, is, mm. is what, what drives energy. And that's what I'm really interested in. Wow. That's, I love all of that because that all makes sense. And I can hear, I can hear myself listening to songs as I come across new songs on Spotify and thinking those things, thinking, I feel like this is going somewhere that's going to be good, but it's now taken a minute and a half and we haven't gotten there. So I'm moving on to the next song or, yeah. you know, things like that. So, or the, the, the high energy and then pull back and all that stuff. Like it, it all stems out of psychology, which is what you're all about, which I really, really love. Now I do need to ask one more thing before we uh, finish our episode that has nothing to do with songwriting. I saw that you also develop board games. How did you get into that? <laughs> kind of like I get into any of those things, I think, and how I got into songwriting as well. It's just like for, for um, like how I got into teaching, for example, is I just watched a lot of people a lot of really good people do it. I, I played a lot of board games. I really, really got into it uh, for 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 a time. I uh, played a lot of board games, and after a while, I was just like, "This is this is so cool. I want to make something like that myself." Mm. Uh, like I, I'm like that. Like I watched a, for a while. I watched like these YouTube videos of people building guitars. And I was like, oh man, I, I, okay. I've watched enough videos now. I want to build a guitar now. So I built my own guitar, and it's yeah. That's just kind of how my brain works. Like I think every everything that I consume needs to lead to me creating something. Otherwise, I really feel like I've just wasted my time on mm. YouTube again. <laughs> so yeah, and and now I can I can pretend like every time I play a game, it's research for the next board game <laughs> that I'm developing. Uh, and every time I, I buy a new board game and my, I, my wife rolls her eyes at me, I can be like, no, no, research, honey, research. Well, good on you though. So many of us spend time watching things on YouTube, aspirationally think I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this, I'm going to cook this, all that. And then we don't, and <laughs> you know, we kind of live vicariously through. So that's cool that you, you really feel like when you put your energy into learning something, you expect something creative to come out of it. And I'm assuming that most people listening to this are that way about music. So I'm sure they would love to connect with you further. Can you let them know how to find your YouTube channel, the best places to connect with you online? Sure. Uh, so it's the YouTube channel is called Holistic Songwriting. That's H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C, Songwriting, Holistic. Holistic Songwriting on YouTube. Uh, we have a website called holistic-songwriting.com. I think we probably also have holistic-songwriting.com without the dash. I'm not sure, actually. But, you know, find out. Maybe just Google it. Um, and, uh, yeah, our best course for sure is Holistic Songwriting Academy. If you want to do like a try before buy, we have a course called the 24-Hour Song, which is about the song process that I mentioned of how to write a song uh, quicker, better, without killing yourself over it. The book, The Addiction Formula, is also something that a lot of people really like. I think that's for a lot of people that was really like the the thing that kind of brought them, made them pay attention to holistic songwriting. And yeah, we have a, if you, if you don't want to pay any money for anything, we also have a, a free, uh, free resource, which is called uh, fill that page, which is about how to write just more lyrics. If you're struggling with filling your page of actually getting the words out and actually figuring out how to write about your subject, how to write enough lines so you actually can finish your song. And that's what that is all about. That just gives you a bunch of 
just very practical tools for like, hey, here's how you can double your, your word count without getting boring, obviously, right? Very important thing is not just like, okay, come up with 50 more ways to say the same thing in different words. That's not what we're teaching, right? You're not writing a thesaurus, you're writing lyrics. It's about really how to become a better storyteller, how to become a better writer and how to, yeah, grab someone's uh, attention. And that's all in there. That's that's on our website as well on holisticsongwriting.com. Check that out. Those are all some fantastic resources. So thank you, Friedemann, for all of your knowledge that you laid out today and for directing us to all these great resources. I really appreciate you spending some time with us today. Hey, thanks so much, Bri. I really appreciate it. And bye, everyone. Thanks for, for joining us. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.